Any Chef, we already have um, Ashley saying this is the most exciting thing to happen in months. Oh. Well, I haven't said anything yet, so we'll see about that. We already have um, Ashley saying this is the most exciting thing to happen in months. Okay. Hi, guys. We are here with Chef Mishama Bailey. She graduated from ICE in 2001. She's now the executive chef of the Gray and the Gray Market in Savannah, Georgia. She was the 2019 James Beard Award winner for Best Chef Southeast. She starred on Netflix's Chef's Table, um, season six, episode one. And I think what's most exciting is she's made Savannah a place that people travel for the food now, not just the culture or the attractions. And she's gonna make a dish for us. Oh yeah. Hi, I'm so, so, so privileged and excited to be here. Um, this is my alum. So I'm just, I'm an alumni of the school. And I was probably one of the first graduating classes when it actually turned into ICE. Um, um, it was Peter Comes Before. And I just kind of hit it at the right time. And I feel like ever, my whole cooking career, I've sort of hit certain parts of it at the correct time. So I'm very happy to be here and tell you a little bit about my story and um, cook for you in my tiny kitchen. <laughs> I literally have one, two, three, four, I don't know, seven or eight um, cookbooks stacked on top of a shoebox, um, So you all can see my face. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. So um, today what we're gonna make, <laughs> Today, what I'm gonna make for you, um, along with you, is um, a dish called Savannah Red Rice. I will send um, Ice the recipe that we use at the Gray, because as I was prepping it out, I realized that I didn't have a recipe that you all could follow along with. So I'm going to be very general, um, because that's ultimately my cooking style. And as we go on and as this is over, I will just um, immediately forward over the recipe so y'all could refer to it at a later date. Um, so the reason why I chose Savannah Red Rice is because um, as a child, my family, my mom is from Waynesboro, Georgia, which is about 90 miles away from here. And I'm the oldest and, and my parents early in their marriage or early in their relationship, they lived in Savannah. And so um, we, I went to elementary school here, and then when I went moved when we all moved to New York City, I do remember my mother making red rice, and I wasn't quite sure. I didn't pay it any attention until I came back to Savannah, and I started doing research about um, different rice dishes in Savannah. And so I remember actually calling on my brother, being really excited because I thought that we had unlocked some sort of mystery about this region um, in the 80s. <laughs> but, you know, this is a very old um, dish and I'm just happy to share it with you. So I'm gonna sort of flip my camera down a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on and I will start the process with you and you'll hear my voice a little bit. I'm six feet tall, so you can't see my head. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start off with like a little bit of olive oil, a couple of tablespoons in um in this pan and ultimately i'm going to start off with the holy trinity which is um sort of the uh creole um mirepoix and they usually start a lot of their sauces off that way so we have some onion wait first oil sorry and i'll let that heat up just a little bit Gonna have to just cover the bottom of the pan so I can ensure that all my um, vegetables are coated with um, oil. Um, the reason why I just did decide to do this dish um, is because it's actually called, um, they refer to it here as purlu. And um, one of the very famous purlus is a tomato purlu. So you'll see the reason why this dish is red is because it has a lot of tomato in it. And tomato purlu is something that was found in an old Savannah cookbook. 
And um, it's indicative to this region because this region is a, is a rice region. A lot of rice was grown here um, in, the 18, uh, in the 1800s. And because of that rice, there were certain things, there were byproducts that came from that rice. So um, I actually have a rice plant that I can show you all right now while I'm waiting for my oil to eat up. Grab it for me. I have someone here helping me. <laughs> rice grows in a husk. Um, it grows tall like grass and it grows in a little bit of a husk. And this rice, um, as you can kind of see the kernels a little bit, there are bits of rice in each of these little holes. And the old school process of that was be that they would pick the rice, each, each hole, and they would crack it by shaking it up against each other. Except where's that rice from? This rice is from Wormslow. It's, a, it's one of the oldest plantations in the region, and it's one of the oldest growing, um, it's one of the oldest plots of land that used to grow food here. It's no longer a working farm, it's a research center. And they decided to do a, pro a rice project. Um, it was sponsored by Anson Mills. And so um, there's a gentleman called Roland, I can't, I can't remember his last name, but he grows for Anson Mills and he's one of the best rice growers in the region. So he took on this project to see how the soil will react to the rice. and. He said that it's one of the best crops that he's ever grown. So I had an opportunity to go out there, see the field before they harvested it. And um, I took some rice home with me and now it's like a decoration in my, <laughs> in my dining room. So there's different parts of the rice that are really interesting. Um, rice, people found that the whole grains were really attractive. They came, they came with the highest price tag. And, the, and in harvesting rice, you tend to get bits and pieces of it. And those, those bits and pieces we now call the midlands, or we call the grits, rice grits. And that's what we're going to be cooking with today. And those bits and pieces went for free, or they went for a much, much lower price. And those were usually rationed off to the um, enslaved labor that usually that at that time harvested the rice. So this is a very traditional dish. It's stewy, it's comforting, it can feed a lot of people, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to make and talk about. And it also tells you a lot about where we are. <laughs> All right, so we're almost ready. Do you have any questions for me <laughs> while I'm sort of going along? Well, yeah, I guess I was thinking about how you went home to Savannah and a bunch of our students and alumni um, recently had to go home because of the pandemic. So how did you kind of like develop those relationships with purveyors and connect with your network? So when I came to Savannah in 2014, you're right, I didn't know anyone. And I had to, I actually met someone who was a part of the Southern Foodways Alliance. And she introduced me to a network of farmers and purveyors. Before meeting her, her name was um, Cynthia Hayes. And before meeting Cynthia Hayes, I didn't know a soul. And I was not sure how I was going to um, supply the restaurant. And the cool thing about meeting someone who's really in tune with the community is that you start to get a feel for the community. I think that I did not know. I think when I was when I came down here in 2014, I probably was going to cook something very close to what I learned in culinary school. And that is what I learned. That's sort of like the types of cuisines that I sought after once I graduated school. So I worked in Italian restaurants and French restaurants and Mediterranean restaurants, super European centric and until I met Cynthia Hayes and I started working with um, a local a local food a local food source and also African American food source and started asking questions about the region and that wasn't until then that I started to want to dig deeper into why people ate the way they did in this particular part of the south mm -hmm. that's a great resource which yeah. Are rice grits something that can be purchased? 
Yes, so they can be purchased online by um, Anson Mills. And there's also a company um, in Edison, South Carolina called Marsh Hen Mills. Um, they also sell rice grits. And so um, you can purchase them online through them. They'll, they'll mail it to you, yeah. Sometimes, um, you know, some stores in the South, like depending on the region of where you are, I know you're all in New York, so I don't mean to emphasize like the South, the South, the South. I did forget for a second that you're all in New York. I thought this was national, <laughs> but um, oh, someone's in LA. But sometimes at Whole Foods, they sell, um, they sell rice grits, so. You might be able to find them there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not much is happening here right now, but we are sauteing the Holy Trinity. We have onion, we have celery, we have bell pepper. I'm also going to put in some red bell pepper. And I'll show you guys in a minute once it kind of gets to this beautiful consistency before we add the rice. Um, I can't believe I graduated school almost uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and tell the students what Peter Combs was like. I'm sorry? Tell the students what Peter Combs was like. Well, I, Peter Combs was in a, in a, in a walk up on 96th street. And I actually came to Peter Combs when they first moved to that building. So there wasn't, I think there's like a Best Buy next door on 6th Avenue and like this whole sort of apartment complex next to this apartment building next door. There wasn't any of that. It was like really like, not really grungy. It was like 6th Avenue and 23rd Street grungy. Um, but um, it was only two levels. It was only two floors. There was a third floor where the pantry was. And the work study program was awesome. It was killer. And it was, I was um, before, I, I, right when I started classes was when the school became accredited. So I was really sort of working hour for hour. So I did work study at Peter Combs and I um, would barter my time for tuition, which was one of the smartest things I did. I had already graduated um, college and I had a degree in social work. And so I did not want to take on any more debt. So I decided to sort of work, um, work my way through school, work my way up the ladder, so to speak. Smart. Um, and how was your transition from culinary school to working in restaurants to owning your own? That's a big one. That's a big one. It was a journey. It was hard. <laughs> it was hard. Um, it was, you know, I think the work was a little bit of a shocker. One of the stories that I really, really like to tell, I'm going to show you really quickly and then I'm going to get into that story because we still, I want to speed this up a little bit. So these, this is our Holy Trinity. I have some red bell pepper, some onion, garlic, celery. We're going to kind of get that nice and translucent and then we can start to build on our sauce before we add our rice or build our base before we add our rice. So um, I was already working, I was working in a completely different industry when I started cooking and I was, I was dabbling in it in this really sort of innocent way, a naive way. And um, once I started going to cooking school, that's all I was doing. Like I was no longer employed in my old field. So I started um, doing, um, I started working as a stage for cooking classes at the school. I worked at this little cafe and I did that because I wanted to immerse myself into um, really the industry and understand what was expected of me. And I think that I was just in the very beginning, I would have my head down and I was really willing to learn and um, do the work. So when I was out of school and I went for my externship, it wasn't like this huge shocker for me. The hours were obviously longer. The camaraderie was way different 20 years ago. It was like boys club, boys club, boys club. But now I think um, it is way more, um, it's just 
way more um, open and accepting of all people who are in the industry. It's not sort of uber focused on one type of person or one or how one person looks or where they're from. So I, I struggled a little bit with finding uh, finding equal footing in the kitchen when I first started more so than I struggled with the work. And so I think that part was the part that I had to kind of um, accept and get over and carve out a niche for myself. And then as and then as I went on and I wanted to kind of move up, the money was a little bit of a problem. So I did start working as a um, personal chef to sort of supplement my income. And then I realized that I didn't want to chase the money. I realized that I wanted to get back into kitchens. And so I think the biggest thing that I would say, or one of the one of the things that I relied on consistently throughout my career was having a support system, was having um, someone's couch that I can sleep on that you know was closer to the restaurant than mine, um, having a place where I can go and let my hair down and talk about what I was doing, having someone that I can borrow money from. Like it was, it was, I, I sort of needed my friends and family, I needed to rely on them. And so um, that those were the people who kind of helped me get through it. Because I think in the very first years of cooking, when you're becoming acclimated to the industry, it's, it's, it's daunting. And you kind of need someone in your corner to tell you that you're going to be fine, you can do it, it's totally fine. And we support you and you're making the right decision. And so transitioning from um, climbing up that ladder to um, becoming a, an executive chef at the gray, I was kind of faking it until I made it. Like I was like, I was, I was serious and I felt like I was searching for what my voice was, but I was underqualified, <laughs> but, I, but I totally was like, okay, I can do this. And I just think that me and my business partner had a, had, we were just such a good fit that we and we both didn't know what we were doing so we sort of started from the bottom and we kind of figured it out so <laughs> all right so i think you can i don't know if you can see but the steam is starting to kind of come up a little bit and what i like to do here is i want to add my spices so i have some chili chilies that we dried and ground up, bajillo chilies that we dried and ground up That's from the restaurant. We smoked them in the smoker and we dried them and ground them up. So I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of that. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of smoked paprika. And then I'm gonna add about a teaspoon of white pepper and I'm gonna combine. and let those spices sort of begin to attach themselves and toast a little bit in the pan before I add the tomato. So these are just um, plum tomatoes in their sauce. I'm gonna get a little dirty here. I'm gonna break these open to let out some of the, some of the juice on the inside and give them a little bit of squeeze into the pan. And I'm doing that because I don't really want to add that extra um, liquid. And I want these tomatoes to kind of get a little jammy and caramelize a little bit with the vegetables. Um, you can totally be more prepared than me and <laughs> do this ahead of time and chop them up so all the sizes are the same like your tomatoes are going to be the same size as your onions and the same size as your rice but since we're cooking at home today i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make a big fuss i'm just gonna try to squeeze them through my fingers really well and you can see some of that tomato liquid is in the bottom of that pan A quick rinse and a dry. 
then I'm gonna stir again. Yes. So that was about a cup of tomato. And I'm gonna turn this up a little bit so it can start to evaporate and concentrate some of the some of those uh, tomato juices. Chef, you know, Fab, uh huh. What kind of chilies were those? Guajillo. That's right, Sean. So I'm gonna. Um, I haven't added any salt yet, and I am gonna add some salt right about now. Those tomatoes had no salt in them. We are just so budget right now. Let me move my camera so I can get my salt. <laughs> 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 and chef, someone's asking. No kitchen is too small, people, <laughs> to work your magic. <laughs> the New Yorkers now. Yeah, exactly. I'm a New Yorker, so this is, this is very cozy for me. Um, Megan from Toronto is asking if the rice is in any way related to jollof rice. Oh, that's a good question. I yes, 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 yes. So. Let's talk about jollof rice. So um, in my own research, right, I'm not a historian. I don't know a ton about this, but what I do know is that on the border, there are bordering islands from North Carolina all the way down to Florida. And on those bordering islands, um, there is an African-American community that identify themselves, that call themselves Geechee Gullah. And this Geechee Gullah community um, is really one of the last um, African American communities in this country to really uphold a lot of African traditions. And I believe, and I know that jollof rice and tomato perlu really sort of, they have met on the other side of the ocean, on, on the other side of the Atlantic. So I do think that jollof and rice and this version of Perlu are completely connected and they probably have a lot of the same um, same um, ingredients. One of um, one of my friends who is from Cameroon came to the gray and we um, we do the, we do this rice and we usually we kind of boil it up and we'll fry it and she immediately referred to it as jollof rice. So I, so yes, it is related. All right, so we're gonna cook this down a little bit more. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of white wine. White wine, because I'm from, you know, the Institute of Culinary Education and we, they taught us to cook with uh, white wine. It's also adds the sweetness and depth to the dish that um, we really enjoy. <laughs> So I'm just going to let it cook out a little bit. But one of the things, one of the wonderful things about living here was discovering that Geechee Gullah community. And I think um, Cynthia Hayes, who was a member of the SFA, uh, Southern Foodways Alliance, and she was also the founding um, president of Saffron, um, the the Southern African Farmers um, Network, Organic Network. I know that's not all, that's not the complete acronym, but, um, and I will figure it out and put that along with the recipe. She was, she really kind of um, connected me to a lot of African Americans in the community. And when you connect to, America, to those people in this particular community, you are educated and um, schooled on elements of the Geechee Gullah culture. Um, they live by the water, they live by the seasons, um, they live on what is in the water. You know, I'm a New York City girl and I have, I did not know that black folks ate o oysters not on a regularly, you know, not regular black folks, you know, maybe some other kind of black folks are, you know, more, more traveled or, or foodie sort of black folks, but regular black folks down here eat oysters. And that was something that really intrigued me and not to pass judgment. I just know that um, it's just something that's not really accessible in, in the North. So to come down here and find that it was 
part of their, you know, winter celebrations, the part of their New Year's Day and part of their um, weekend sort of roasts and barbecues, then there's a level of exposure that's like, huh, all right, there's a lot more here that I don't know and um, I'm willing to learn more about it. All right, so I like it. I like to call this stage sort of like the jammy stage. Okay. Someone's asking, uh, is there a big difference between using white wine and vermouth? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's a big difference between that. I mean, there's a flavor difference, obviously. Um, I think vermouth would be, would probably have um, some bitter notes and I feel like white wine would add, enhance the sweetness of the vegetables, but it's really about what your palate is. And I think that, um, yeah, I think it's really about what you like. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna let this wine cook out and then we're gonna introduce the rice and then we're gonna start to build the dish. <laughs> Again, or right, continue to build the dish. <laughs> Any other questions? These are great questions. Yeah, this is uh, not about the recipe, but Shinari is asking, do you have any advice for a young black chef opening a soul food and Southern food restaurant in New York? Uh, I think location is probably important. Um, understand your investments and your terms. Um, you know, be able to pay back those loans and make sure that you're going to get some behinds in those seats. I think the advice, um, the best advice about the food is, you know, if you love it, people are going to love it. Trust your gut, trust your instincts. You know, you're doing this for a reason. And so make sure that the food that you put on that plate, you stand behind it hundred percent. Um, it's not someone else's variation of it. It's your own. So no matter what happens, you can hold your head up high and you can understand that you put what you needed to put in there. Also, give yourself time to um, rest, you know, like don't feel like you, you need to be open seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day, 12 months out of the year. You, that is not sustainable. You have to give yourself some room and some space in order to grow because you're gonna, if you continue to work and work and work, you'll start to miss the small things. And those little small delicate nuances are why people are choosing your restaurant over someone else's. So you have to nurture that, that part of you um, in order to continue to feed you know, the food in a way where people are gonna, are gonna get what you're trying to tell them. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, we're waiting for the wine to reduce and um, I'm gonna grab the rice and I'll be right back. Oh, hello. <laughs> it's, it's off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna show you guys what rice gets look like. So um, I kind of wanna show you in comparison to, so in comparison to, um, sorry, in comparison to the rice itself, these are little bits. And I rinse this because um, you'll see in a few minutes that I, I just want the sauce to kind of coat the rice and I, I don't want the starch to get in the way. I don't want the starch to sort of uh, be a barrier between the rice and the sauce. So I, I just lightly rinse, um, rinse this. I don't need to rinse it till it's clear, 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 but I do want to rinse the majority of the, of the um, starch off. And so if I was to crack open this hull, you'll see that this rice is sort of half the size. Oops. <laughs> I kind of 
broke that one with my nail. But you'll see that this rice is sort of half the size. Um, and back then when you were harvesting everything by hand, size mattered. People cared about that because that was money and you can charge more for those bigger things. So this is what that rice looks like out of the hole. And this is what the rice bits look like. So. I want to fold. It. So this is a pint of rice. I want to fold. I'm going to fold about two thirds of it in here. Make sure I have enough room. What I have back here is uh, fumé. And um, this is fumé we've made from, I think, Red Snapper at the restaurant. So I'm going to use this to cook the rice. And I'm going to cook it like risotto. And I also guess that's sort of where that wine comes in too, right? We're, we're, cooking, we're cooking this like a traditional Italian dish, but we're using ingredients from the Southeast. Chef, are both restaurants open right now? They are open right now. So the gray market has been open for about three months. Um, and we were on open on and off during the pandemic. And the gray itself, we've been open about two months, maybe a little bit more. Um, it, 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 we're being received really well. I think um, during this time, it's hard. I think, you know, um, people, you know, there's no vaccination. People are still getting sick. so. It's hard to um, sort of keep anxiety down, I think, but we're doing our best. We're following our, we're following the guidelines and we're promoting, um, you know, safety within, with the staff. And so I think that's um, allowing a lot of our guests to feel more comfortable about coming in and spending time with us. Um, we have a chef asking what is fumet? What is what? That thing in the other pot. Did you say fumet? Fumet, yes, yeah, sorry. Fumet is uh, fish stock. Yeah. So we make our fumet, our fish stock, with um, onions and fennel and um, a little bit of lemon and um, parsley. is asking, what is the best way to network and find mentorship in the hospitality industry? Um, that's a really good question because I am um, the, I'm the chairwoman of the Edna Lewis Foundation and we just gave out scholarships for young culinary um, people, young, um, young storytellers, uh, people who are writing and young um, and people who are farming. And I think for, I think the best way is first you can start at your school. You can start you know within your own community, the people that you can actually kind of reach out and touch. And then I think if you are if you don't have anyone you in your school and you've graduated, you can either find someone through work, um, maybe one of your one of your managers, you can probably um, talk to about mentorship, or you can also look into different organizations that you like, you know, organizations that represent the same sort of values and thoughts that you have surrounding food and culture. And you can reach out to those people because, um, you know, a lot of reason why they are members of these organizations or why are, are, are R2, R2D2, R2 um, sort of be uh, mentors to uh, young people. Yeah. Steph, you want to come guest lecture? <laughs> sure, a free trip to New York. Woohoo! <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm assuming it's free. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Any questions?
this is good. I feel like I get very quiet when I cook. You know, I'm not that experienced with any demos or anything like that. So <laughs> I don't want it to be like awkward dead stare. We are getting questions in the chat. Um, Ashley's asking, is it worth the investment going to culinary school when you are already working as a cook? Is she missing out by not doing school? She's already got one degree. Ugh. Um. Let me tell you, if I had to pay for school, I probably wouldn't have learned. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else wants to come? <laughs> However, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's really about what you want to do. And I knew that going to school was important to me because I wanted to learn about other cultures. I wanted to learn about other cuisines. So it was important for me to go to cooking school because I knew that I was starting from a place that I did not feel like I had enough. Um, I did not feel like I had enough background and fundamental education and um, information. And I wanted to, I wanted to um, find that in a classroom environment. And so for me, it was a no-brainer that I would go to cooking school. I had, I could have had an option to just go to a restaurant and learn from there. But I feel like there's um, there's this ease with it. But I, I also feel like people give, I think you have to take whatever you do in life seriously, right? Like don't waste your time. Like if you're gonna, like don't waste the time to go to school and not take advantage of the network that the school has. Don't waste your time and go through the industry by working through the industry and not try to go to the best restaurant in your city or the best restaurant in the town next door to you. Work for the best, you know, and that's why school is important because you have a collection of professionals who've worked around the country and around the world that really can, can really help you. And so um, I think it's a personal choice. I think it's, um, I think it has a lot to do with finance. I think it has a lot to, to do with, you know, how you process information and so I think it's, a, I think you have to um, make that decision for yourself. But I know for me, it was important for me to go to school because I don't think I would be as enlightened about what is out there if I didn't do that. Fair enough. And Chef, what do you look for when you hire? Um, passion, you know, work ethic. Like you don't have to know a lot about food, but I want you to be able to scrub a pot or show some initiative or you know, sweep the floor, or you don't have to know anything. You just have to want to be there. And I think a lot of people take that for granted and they take advantage of that. They feel like they've spent the money or, and they've educated themselves or they feel like they have, um, they have paid their dues and um, they kind of get a little complacent um, some people get cocky and arrogant, but I think you're forever learning in this business. And if you don't think you are, then you're being really foolish about it. And so um, I think just, you know, people who I, I really look for people who are willing to roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty. Yeah. All right. They're rolling in. So tell me when you, when you want to talk about the cooking, but I'll keep going if you want. Yeah, you can keep going. Oh, let me show you really quickly. Sorry, I just I was like, yeah, you keep going, but let me wait. Um, so this is so we're gonna continue to cook the, to cook this down and add fume. And what I'm gonna do is show you all the um the end product or you know closer to the end product. But you see how wet this rice is. This rice is gonna be wet, but not for long, because what's it's just absorbing all of this liquid. It's absorbing all the spices, the tomato, the salt, the onion, the garlic, the fume. And so I am just sort of stirring it and making sure that it doesn't stick and also making sure that all the grains are well coated. But um, this is kind of where we're at. And so it doesn't take as long as you think. I think people who work in restaurants um, or people who cook a lot at home or even in your classes, like you've all sort of made similar dishes like this with rice. And so it doesn't take a long time. You just have to know when to pull it. 
It also, um, what also accelerates the cook time is when you heat your stock. So if you heat your stock, you can, you know, you're gonna move through this a little bit faster, but um, you know, this, is, this has got a little ways to go, but not too far. But I just wanna let you know like how generous I'm being with the liquid, how often I'm stirring um, because what, what the starches that are left, I still want to release them and help them to thicken and bind the sauce. The, 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 yeah, the sauce. And so I just sort of wanted to give you all a little bit of a, you know, look-see. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, speaking of that, Chris is asking what kind of pots and pans you prefer? I, um, for, I have, um, I have... <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I wanted these pots and my grandmother talked me out of them. So right now the pots that I have are Cuisinart, but I really like All Clad. I like All Clad a lot. They are affordable. They don't seem affordable, but they are very affordable for what you get. And when you are cooking at home and especially with desires to cook professionally, you beat up this equipment and you want equipment that's gonna last and last and last. So I have Cuisinart um, and at the restaurant, we are moving into um, made-in products. So they're a newer um, sort of pot brand and they, um, they're awesome. And they have a lot of like Grant Atkins um, is a spokesperson for it. The chef from Girl in a Goat is a spokesperson for it. And so they um, really are up on the rise. And this pot is from them. This pot is from, um, oh, sorry. Hello? Um, so, so Maiden is sort of um, the pan, pots and pans that we're gonna start to move through for, um, for the restaurant. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, but get the best that you can afford and understand that they're just gonna really kind of um, beat, you're gonna beat them up, you know? And Tim is asking what a day at the Gray is like for you. How do you come up with the menu and food you serve at the restaurant? So the food that I serve is probably an easier question to answer. So the food that I, we serve at the restaurant is called Port City Southern. Um, and the reason why we call it Port City Southern is because we're a city, we're a port city. And the, we are lucky enough to be influenced by a lot of different things. We are influenced by, um, you know, there's a island off of the coast that's called Asaba. And Asaba is a brand of, is, is a pig, is a pig breed. And that pig breed is from Spain. So we, uh, you know, there have been Spanish set settlers here. It's one of, this city has the second largest St. Patrick's Day parade in the nation. And so a lot of people come down to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So there's an Irish community that settled here. Um, there's a dish that we do at the restaurant called Chicken Country Captain. So there's um, a spice and that has curry in it. So the spice trade has come through here. And not to mention French and Italian um, influences. There's a, a large Jewish community here and an African American and African community here. So we have a real opportunity to really explore Southern food through, um, through Africa, through Europe, and also really through American eyes. So that's, a, that's the food. And a day is, my days are crazy. They, um, they tomorrow, is Wednesday. We're closed uh, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, Monday's more of an admin day, do the ordering, do the schedule. Tuesday is an off day. And then tomorrow is a, a prep and meeting day. So it's sort of a half day. So we go in at eight, we start prepping, we leave around five. And then on Thursday, we have service. We only, we're only doing dinner service. So dinner service starts at six o'clock. Um, but prep starts at nine in the morning. So get there at nine in the morning. Um, we prep, the cooks, um, line cooks come in at two. Um, they set their stations up, they make family meal. They work a four hour service, I think now. Yeah, six to 10 and then break down the kitchen and go home. So I usually leave around 10 p.m. between 10 and 11 p.m. at night. 
And as, as the prep list gets shorter and shorter, I go in later and later. So by Saturday, I'll probably go in by 1030, you know? <laughs> um, speaking of that, you were mentioning um, that it's important to rest. And mm -hmm. I was asking what you do that allows you to rest and feel inspired. What I, oh, okay. You know, I, I talk a big game is what I do. I don't, <laughs> I don't necessarily <laughs> practice all that I preach, but um, in those moments that I do that, um, I really like going to the beach. I really like, I have a greyhound uh, dog. I was going to say puppy. She's not a puppy. She's five years old and she's taller than me, but I have a greyhound and um, she's an ex racer, retired racer. And so those dogs raced on sand. So I love to take her to the beach and just kind of like let her off the leash and watch her kind of run around in these big circles. It kind of, it brings me a lot of joy and I love just being near the water. Um, so I like to do that. Um, I try to do that once every few weeks. I'll go in the morning and um, before the beach gets full while you can have pets on the beach and I'll, I'll do that. Um, I like to watch Netflix and sit on my couch and eat popcorn. I like to check out, seriously. I love to watch movies. Um, I really, um, I really like to go on walks. Like Savannah's a very, very beautiful place. And so I, I like to walk up, you know, the farmer's market is about a mile away from my house. So, you know, about twice a month, I'll take my dog and we'll walk up early in the morning. And just, I just like to admire how beautiful this city is. So I do a lot of that, yeah. Love that. I will veg out in like a heartbeat. <laughs> Speaking of TV, if you guys haven't watched uh, Mashama's Netflix Chef's Table episode, you should. It's uh, season six, episode one. And she was just on Somewhere oh. South with fellow Isalum, Vivian Howard. Oh, yeah. So, did you do grits in that episode? I did, and she made fun of me. She was like, "This." I was like, "Oh, there's like a little bit of water in these fish." She was like, "There's no water in these. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's all cream." <laughs> <laughs> I love Vivian. Yeah, she's great. You got into this. Is a real deal. She, um, you know, her story. You know, she went. She went to school and worked in the city, and and, and went back home and. This, and built an empire. And I think that there's something really rejuvenating when you, when your expression, when you cook from a, from a good place, from a very personal space. I think it's um, very um, sustainable when you do that, you know, because you begin to understand how to um, keep yourself going because it's this, you know, you, you all know out there, you know how hard this industry is. <laughs> And if you don't know, you're about to find out, so. <laughs> um, interesting you should say that because someone's asking, did you face obstacles being a woman and black in the food industry? And when did you start cooking professionally? Um, I didn't start cooking professionally until I was in my mid twenties. Um, I had already graduated college and I had been working in my um, field for about a, two years. And of course I did, of course, of course there was um, pushback, right? But I didn't really equate it with my sex or my race. I equated it with my experience and maybe that's just sort of my naive optimism. Um, but I never felt, I think there were times that I felt that it was flat out, you know, sexist, you know, I don't think there was ever times that I felt that it was racist, but, um, I only went, I, I tend to lean towards situations that I feel comfortable in. So um, a, a racist situation, I would not feel comfortable in. And I feel like a, a yeah. sexist situation, mm -hmm. I, would, I would fight it out, you know? Maybe Thursday. Shabbat um, Shabbat Uh, 
Sorry, did you see me burn my mouth? Okay. <laughs> I thought I was invisible for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you got a taste there. <laughs> oh my God. This is hot. Okay. I think we're there, people. All right, let's let's show you the end results. I'll put it on a plate. Um, I'll put it in a bowl because I don't think it's going to look that pretty on a plate. So, you know, you want that grit consistency. You want it to, you want it to flow and stop like a gravy or a sauce, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can see all of the little bits um, that we sauteed and cooked. You can see all the sauce. You can see it all kind of like coating in that grain, those grains rather. Mm -hmm. And um, the grains are just translucent. So there's like a little bite, but not, not a lot, not a ton of bite. Um, mushy, you've gone too far. Um, but, you know, just a little bit of, a um, little bit of texture and saucy. Very, very saucy. So nice. There you have it. It took under an hour. <laughs> Chef, I saw um Yelagichi red rice from Charleston on Taste the Nation. What makes this Savannah red rice? You know what? <laughs> I <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think I think everybody has I think everyone claims it but I was supposed to put shrimp in this rice but I didn't so I was gonna, so I'm like listen <laughs> red rice is with shrimp and now I'm like just imagine that there's shrimp <laughs> and then there you have it <laughs> I'm sorry shrimp a lot at the restaurant yeah we do a lot of shrimp um right now it's white shrimp season so um, we do um, we do we're doing fried shrimp right now. Um, next week we're going to do this dish on the menu. We're going to do um, shrimp midlands, uh, but the shrimp midlands that we do have a shrimp stock, and um, the, the 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 base is a little bit different. There's no bell pepper in it. It's only and there's no celery in it. It's onion and garlic, and bay leaf. And so we pick that up and we'll do a shrimp stock with the shells and the heads and um, we'll cook it like a risotto and then we'll fold in shrimp and we'll serve it like that. And the spice level is however you want, you know. So the seasonings are just a little bit different, but the technique is the same. And where's the snapper from? Is that available in Savannah? Yeah, so we get, so we, um, our fishermen usually run down to Florida and they'll grab fish and we use um, abundant seafood out of um, Charleston, South Carolina. And we also use um, sea eagle out of Buford, South Carolina. And um, those are our two main people. And we use Russo Seafood, which is a local seafood purveyor, but they're mainly a retail purveyor. They're not, um, they do wholesale, but we usually go, you know, we usually go to them in case of emergency, but they usually sell, they usually have snapper on hand, porgy, um, flounder, a lot of flounder in these waters around here. Okay. Mm -hmm. You ready for a slew of questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have two, two different ways of asking what your favorite dish is to make at home. And along with that, do you find it hard? Do you want to cook at home after you're at the restaurant all day? I never cook at home when I'm at the restaurant all day. <laughs> but I do cook at home about once a week. So I like having food in the house. I'm a very, I snack. And like I told you, I like watching movies and stuff like that. So I constantly want something around. And I used to smoke cigarettes. So having something healthy to eat, I like doing that. So crunchy things I like having in the house. Um, celery, uh, carrots, uh, popcorn, those types of things, chips. I don't like having chips because I'll eat the whole bag. But um, 
I will cook probably at home on a Monday or a Tuesday or both. So usually the thing that I love to make is a pasta because they're usually quick. I like to time myself at the stove um, because I do stand a lot. So I'm sort of like, if I can't make it in 20 minutes, then I don't want to deal with it. And that's just standing time. It can cook for hours, but if I'm standing for more than 20 minutes, I'm not that interested in um, cooking it again. So mm -hmm. that's definitely one of the things that um, I like to cook is pasta. I also love um, making rice dishes at home. I like, you know, and because I like having leftover rice because then you can do a fried rice later on in the week or whatever. So those types of rice and pasta are mainly the things that I like to cook. Um, I also, I live, you know, a block away from the retail seafood purveyor. So usually I'll do, sometimes I'll do crab rice which is also um, a very Savannah thing or a very low country thing where you have onions and garlic and you cook the, you um, caramelize the crab in that and then you fold the rice into that. So that's a real fun dish to have and it's super quick and it's good if you have leftover rice. It's such a good sort of non, you know, traditional kind of fried rice dish. Um, and then I'll grab, you know, some shrimp from there, or some tuna or whatever they have. And how frequently do you change the menu at the Gray? So uh, pre-COVID, we changed the menu probably four to six times a year. Four times we probably did wholesale changes. And within that three month gap, we would take something off and put something on. But the, the menu looked very, very familiar for four months, you know, three to four months. Um, now, did I say post-COVID? I meant pre-COVID. Now, post-COVID, um, we change it every two weeks. Oh, wow. Every two weeks, yeah. So we are doing prefix menus now, and we're also doing taste, we, we have a chef's tasting, which has always been like a little bit of a dream of mine, but I never thought that you could actually do it. And the reason why we switched to this format is to allow us to actually purchase food and move through all of it in a creative way. And I think before, and it doesn't allow for complacency. So we can support the farmers. So I can call up someone and say, okay, do you have a pig or what kind of fish do you have this week? Or, um, you know, uh, what are you growing? How, you know, what's happening in the seasons and then in the, in the garden or on the farm. And so, we take those ingredients and we kind of look into our repertoire and we see what we have, or we kind of come up with new dishes that, that are inspired by those ingredients. So we've been doing that for the last eight weeks. So tastings and prefix menus, it's been, it's been really challenging, um, but I think the, the cooks are having a ball. Like everyone is learning at like rapid speed because we're just changing things so fast. And sometimes the technique, the, the technique is the same, but the ingredients are different. Or sometimes you're just learning a whole new technique. I like that. Sounds like creative outlet. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone's asking, where do you see yourself? What do you see yourself doing next? And do you have any upcoming projects you can share? <laughs> Um, well, I, I, next I see myself, um, I don't know, I think, um, cooking for a little bit longer. And I think after cooking, hopefully I'll be writing somewhere or I'll be, you know, doing speaking engagements or something like that. Um, I, so the project coming up next is my business partner and I just finished writing a book. It's called Black, White and the Gray. And it's actually a book about the um, how how the gray came about, and also how our partnership has come about. And we're dealing with um, you know the issues of being um, partners, the issue of two New Yorkers moving to the South and opening up a restaurant in a not so big city. And also, we're dealing with issues of race. You know, he's white and I'm black, and we didn't realize that. We, we knew, you know, obviously we didn't have that much in common, but we didn't realize how those things would interfere with our partnership until we started to sort of dig in a little bit. Wow, so is that a memoir? 
It is, it is. And it's released, uh, I think the second week of January. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. And Megan's asking, is the name Perlu any related to the name Pelu? Both are rice dishes. Perlu, yeah. So there's Perlu, P-U-R-L-O-O. -O, and um, what she's saying is P-E-R-L-O-U, I think. P-L-A-U. P-L-A-U. No, I don't, I don't, P-L-A-U. I don't know that, but I do know Perlu is also spelled um, two different ways, but it could be, it could be a rice dish from Brazil or, or, or somewhere, somewhere else. Okay. Um, the only other question is how do we all move to Savannah and work for you? <laughs> oh man, get on that Greyhound bus, baby. <laughs> Don't play with my emotions, people. <laughs> I have to ask before we go, um, we talked about how you're a voice for African-American traditions, female chefs, career changers when you came to ICE, and um, for Southern food. What would you say is your culinary voice? My culinary voice is... Oh, I, I feel like all those things you just named. I think my culinary voice um, is tradition. Yeah, I think I'm really a big stickler about history. I, you know, I love uh, researching and learning about what's um, from this region. I'm not really trying to appropriate anything. I'm just trying to celebrate it. Great. And are you starting any new traditions at the Gray? Um, Mm, the tradition that we do have right now is on Thanksgiving Day, we close the restaurant, we do a potluck. Um, a lot of our staff are um, transplants from other cities and they don't, um, they can't go home to their families on Thanksgiving uh, because some of them are from Chicago or, you know, New York. And so um, we do a little potluck, which is our, which is our holiday tradition. So that's a good one. Yeah, it's exactly. Awesome. Yeah so much for your time we really appreciate it guys be sure to follow mashama um go watch her on both shows chef's table and summer south and we wish you luck with the book thank you so much this has been really a big treat thank you so much thanks chef bye guys bye, bye.